My name's Alex. I'll be the speaker today. Outside of my work, I moonlight on a bunch of things on the left here. I primarily work for Tag App Delivery as one of the technical leads, performing due diligence for projects and creating content. When I'm working, I'm the director of Kubernetes at Canonical, so I think about things like micro cates and upstream Kubernetes. And so not an obvious fit to be giving a talk about feature flags, but I think what's interesting is that feature flagging is something that I find very compelling because I think we have a lot of opportunity right now to take feature flagging beyond the browser where it traditionally lives. So I just want to get some forced participation here in the most introvert way possible. If you wouldn't mind just scanning that, you don't have to talk to me, you don't have to say anything, you can just scan that on your phone and we're just going to do a little survey. It'll be 60 seconds, I promise you. I'll leave it up there just for a few seconds. When I change slide, you'll see it again, so don't worry if you miss the opportunity to scan the QR. It'll be up in a moment. So, let's have a look. Let's go right back to the beginning here. Let's start with something simple. How are you enjoying KubeCon? It's my first time in Detroit. It's been amazing. I think it's an incredible city. Brutalist architecture, brilliant people, great conversations. Good, that's the correct answer. <laughs> I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that. Okay, well, let's move on. What does feature flagging make you think of? And this is an interesting question because I think of a lot of different things. Dynamic, that's a good, that's a good answer. A-B testing, that's traditionally what I would think of as well, A-B testing. Blast radius, that's a really, really good idea. Deployment, progressive. These are great. These are great. Access control, safety toggles, et cetera, et cetera. So it sounds like the audience here is pretty well versed in the idea of feature flagging. So thank you for humoring me on that question. And there's one final question. I'll just let these two last participants type. There we go. Final question. Why do you think feature flagging fits best? There's a few, a few options on here in no particular order. You know, where do we have it? You know, I, I think this is a difficult one to answer. As I said at the beginning of the talk, I felt like until I got involved in Open Feature, it was just something you saw in the browser, on the server, maybe in your Node.js runtime or your Flask server. Okay, interesting. The real spread, right? The real spread. So thank you. I can see, I see the results are climbing on client and server. And that's sort of what I anticipated, most people might say. So that's, that's good to know. So we've done our slides. So feature flagging is effectively all of the things you described momentarily ago in that word cloud. It is how you deliver functionality rapidly but safely. And exactly as some of you have said, it, it allows you to do gating or content, A-B testing, you know, think about geofencing. That's a feature. You know, that's a feature that's being flagged. You might have certain capabilities on your, on your movie streaming that are only available in certain regions, and they'll look at the metadata of your profile, and they'll see your email address or your geolocation or something like that. So feature flagging is really important. And you'll see that I put a QR code. I, I just discovered these before this talk, so you're going to see there's a recurring pattern here. Pete Hodgson put a really great article in, uh, on Martin Fowler's blog which was all about feature flagging. And I decided that rather than trying to do this a dis disservice, I would just refer you to the uh, canonical source, no pun intended. So where does it typically occur? So client side and website and, uh, and server side is sort of where you think about it. You know, a web browser, server side, a client side rendering doesn't really matter, but it might make a call, it checks the SDK, then checks its feature flags configuration. This is the simplest kind of occurrence. You know, you think about it sort of like this. You know, you could have a, an API, an SDK that integrates with that, SDI, um, that API. But there's more to it than that. You know, there's caching, there's evaluation, there's synchronization. So I don't mean to do a disservice to feature flag providers. It's, it can be quite complex. And then you've got RBAC users, management, state, et cetera, et cetera. But again, this is primarily the domain of the browser, of the server. And then, we also have a lot of vendors that build feature flags, and these vendors are awesome, but they all have their own interpretation of the world, right? A few little examples 
of what an API might look like or what a function call might look like. There's no particular winner. It's just an implementation. It's how they view the world. It's how they think about evaluating a feature flag. You know, get my thing. Tell me if my thing is blue or is it green, as you'll see. And so I think that given that we're in the age of interoperability, in the age of bringing things together and trying to build open interfaces, this is perfect fresh ground for opportunity for innovation. And if you think about things like service mesh interface and other projects like OpenTelemetry who have come together, a consortium of vendors, and they've decided to build something fairly common, it means that users benefit, which is great. So the goals, I think, generally speaking, are that everyone likes to have vendor agnostic, agnostic approaches because it allows the customers to feel reassured that they're not being locked in. And that enables interoperability because you can start pick and mixing where things go. And of course, we've talked about this idea of performing complex evaluations. So what I've ended up building here is effectively a bucket list for what a project might look like. And this project that I'm describing is Open Feature. Open Feature is a brand new CNCF project, as I'll go into talk about in a moment, for feature flag management. It allows you to have a singular consolidated schema and set of providers and SDKs that are contributed by a collective of providers. People who are incentivized to build really first rate experiences for their customers through Open Feature. And you'll hear me touch point back to OpenTelemetry a few times because that's one of the more successful attempts at doing this across real world vendors who really want to make something better for their customers in open source. The API in Open Feature is simple. It's flexible. It's extensible. It's completely designed by the people who are experts, people who have spent 10, 15 years doing feature flagging who understand their customers, as well as people who are first time contributors like me who have no idea how feature flags have grown historically. So if Open Feature was a project that grew out of an incentivization to build something that's better so that we had that interoperability. It was started by Dynatrace, but quickly and rapidly grew to have a lot more folks from both OpenTelemetry, from feature flagging ISVs, and end users, software delivery companies like myself, only this year. And if you can believe it, we're already in Sandbox. We're a Sandbox project already. So from one KubeCon to another, we're into Sandbox. My participation in all this was based off a chance meeting. I was just larking around in Valencia, as you do, you know, going to parties, being at my booth, trying to talk about Canonical and all the things that we do. And I happened to get involved with some of the open feature folks. And I thought that was really interesting because I heard about it. A colleague of mine from App Delivery said, hey, you should check out Open Feature. We're trying to do some interesting stuff here. And of course, being me, I was thinking, well, I don't do kind of web development. I'm not super interested in that. I'm more interested in things like top of rack switches, hyper channels, Kubernetes orchestration, everything that's not that. And so I started to think to myself, well, you know, I work for a company that builds an operating system that runs on 65% of all Kubernetes in the world, hmm, what should my incentivization be? What would the philosophy be that I would like to bring to this? And so I thought, well, what about if we had a sort of a Unix approach to this? What have we sort of thought about running this as almost like a kernel module, as a, as a system D process? What if we had feature flagging for the shell, for C++, for web servers, for the kernel, right? How would that actually work? How, how would you build something that could talk to a feature flag file, perform evaluations? And then I started thinking about the implications of that. So on 26th of May, super hyped up on, on Coca-Cola and, uh, and tapas and, and good weather, I sort of started thinking about this thing called Flag D, which is a feature flagging daemon that runs more or less anywhere. It's got Power9, S390, ARM64, ARM7, ARM64. It's got about nine, 10 architectures it supports. It follows the Unix philosophy. What's the Unix philosophy? Yeah, it follows the Unix philosophy, which is compactness, completeness, doing one thing really well. But what it does is it integrates with Open Feature. So Open Feature is this standard, this schema, this idea of how you should do things. It's a collection of SDKs and it's also a set of providers. And it became a provider for Open Feature. It is a provider, so it matches the API, 
I had some great people that then joined the project who are experts on this, because I'm not an expert on this. I, I'm, my expertise is on building you know, robust software, but the, their expertise was, was actually on the subject matter. So in this very teeny tiny demo, you can see that I started running it on my Mac, and you can't read this because it's like for ants. But what you should be able to take away from this ASCII terminal is that I'm showing you flag D running, right? So we had this ability in your terminal to do flag evaluation from a file, right? File on one tab, curl on the other, simples. That wasn't quite enough for me, though, because even though we had this compact and simple library, I couldn't help thinking about IPC, right? Couldn't help thinking about using AF Unix sockets. I couldn't help think about other channels and protocols and ways that this could work. And then, of course, when you start extrapolating, you're thinking, well, where does it have to just work on Linux, right? Why does it just, you know, who's going to use this? Another thing, right? You know, it's a, it's a CTL process right now. So I started thinking, well, Kubernetes is something that I do in my day job. What about we took flag D into Kubernetes, right? And I thought, okay, that's an interesting idea. So I sketched up this design, and I'm going to, I'm going to try and do my best to talk you through this. I'm not sure it's legible. It may well not be. So this is like a coffee kind of scribble that I did on Excaladraw, which I promise I'm not paid to mention, but I use all my slides with these guys. So I thought, okay, well, let's think about how this would actually work. We'd have some sort of agent that's running in a container. That container would need to have, a, it would be a sidecar, because the host process wouldn't want to be bound to it. So I didn't, want to, I didn't want to compile anything in. I didn't want to have it as an SDK that was inside that container, because then there was no way to deliver it, right? An application team would have to build flag D into it. I wanted it to be something separate. I wanted it to support RPC, TCP, maybe UDP, datagrams, I don't know. I was just thinking about it this time. And so it started to coalesce into this new project. So I was on a roll here. I think I might commit, I think I merged these both into the Open Feature Project on the same day. But the next project was called the Open Feature Operator. So what this did is this operator effectively would run in your cluster. It would look for feature flag configurations those feature flag configurations, it would then inject via flag D into your workload. And it would do that in a few ways. It would create basically a config file that flag D would read, and flag D, with the help of my esteemed collaborators, now did some somewhat decent evaluation. So I could say from my Flask app, go get me the current color. And flag D would then evaluate that based on some conditions. It's even more com it's even more sophisticated now than it was then. Now it can do percentile-based evaluation. Now it can do all the things I mentioned at the start of this talk. So what's really exciting there is that we're starting to see some sort of smart logic being able to be driven by flag D and consumed by your application. In this example, small as it is, get fruit, right? Apples or bananas. Everyone can relate to that. Apples or bananas. But the flags themselves could be changed through the CRD. So the custom resource in Kubernetes would contain the flags. I wouldn't have to touch that little config file there. And so that was the initial thought. That was the initial thought. We then sort of road tested this a bit. And I realized that that was not the way to go. Config map mounting inside of Kubernetes is not the way to go because the, the least time out on the config map is too long. So if you want to update it, you've got to wait for the reconciliation and it would be up to 60 seconds. So I thought, we need to put this into sixth gear. We need to put the, uh, put the speed on this. So what I then went back to the drawing board, drawing board with was let's use a shared informer factory, which is a capability of the Golang library for client Go. It talks to the API server directly and says, hey, I'm a pod. I'm this flag D pod. And I have a bit of code in me that connects to Kubernetes API. And it tells you that I want to watch this API. So from left to right, the way this works is that I have a deployment. I simply label this end-to-end -end on the deployment. And I have that CRD that matches the name end-to-end. -end. The admission controller goes through the operator. The operator says, hey, I can see this deployment wants to create pods that are open feature pods. It then validates that CR exists, because there's no good creating it if there's no flags to read, right? It then mutates the pod spec. So what it does by mutating it is this pod spec probably only contains one container. It injects a second container, and it sets up the permission. So it creates a cluster role binding, because of course RBAC is a big challenge here, because you're talking to the API server directly. So it creates a cluster role binding. It does all of the machinery to get that working. And then your workload container is able to consume it. Now, the beauty of this 
is because we also build the SDK, the, S the client SDK that you get to work with as a developer, you treat it like localhost always. So if I'm on my Linux machine building this workflow container, I can just spin it up in a CLI, and if I go to Kate's, it's the same experience. I don't need to put any connection strings in. I don't do any of that, the gubbins. All I need to do is say .grpc or .hp or .hps. We support the lot. In fact, we're using the Golang Connect library, which lets you do multiplexing on the same port, which is quite cool. So Kubernetes feature flagging, that's only step one. Now that's, for me, that's vanilla. Let's go to something a bit more interesting. What if we could take this further to start building operators that consumed flags, operators that actually were able to be controlled with flag D? So I started thinking about, well, here's an example program that I wanted to build. It's called Watchman. It's a, it's a validating emission controller. And what happens is that I want to be able to turn it on and off. I should be able to pull the plug on my cluster from creation of pods. It's actually a pretty attractive proposition if you're in a lockdown mode on a cluster. How else would you do it? You'd have to revoke user RBAC, or you'd have to cut the API server off, or you'd have to find any number of, of hacky ways of doing it. But with this, you could use flag D, you could trigger it via flag, and it would simply lower the drawbridge and the validating admission controller in the, in the admission chain would reject it. And so I thought, this is really interesting, because I think we're onto something here. So I'm going to show you a few demos, because I think I've, I've spoken a lot there. So the first thing I want to show you is the demo that some colleagues made using flag D and using Open Feature Operator. You have the controller manager. That's the operator. That's the, the gubbins that I helped put together. And then what that does is that injects flag D into this thing. That thing is the demo deployment. It is one container. But what it's done there is it's injected flag D as a sidecar. I'm sure that you're a very savvy audience who are very familiar with sidecars, but I thought I'd mention it in case you haven't used them before. So let's port forward this demo and see what's going on. So the first thing I would like to do is to put the demo this bit on the left, and I'm going to put my screen on the right so you can see exactly what's going on. So let's refresh this. Cool. So this is a very cool little Fibonacci demo. I made absolutely all of it. No, that's a complete lie. I made none of it, and it just it's great. So this is really useful to demo on, so thank you again for helping me with this. So what happens here is that if we look at the demo deployment, you'll see that you've got the demo, you've got certain flags that are being checked. What happens now is that if I go to the feature flag configuration, I can see that my open feature demo has an end-to-end -end set of feature flags. This is really cool. So now what I can do, this is the spec, by the way, for um, open feature, the schema. So you can see that we can decide on the variance. I'm just doing a very basic example here, but if we go to, say, line 38, and we change this to green, we save that YAML file, we go out of that YAML file, and we save it, then what happens in the background is it upgrades and it turns and changes to that color. Now, what's also interesting, if I let's do a li live demo, is always exciting. Oh, I think my port forward might have timed out. Let's give it another little whirl. Let's have a check. Oh, port forward already exists. OK, there we go. Demos aren't supposed to work the first time. That's just the rule. Let's have a look. OK, so let's go demo deployment. There we go. This is the, the nerve-wracking bit when it never quite works. Let's have a look. We've got a flag not found. Again, like I said, I didn't make any of this. So I'm just going to remind you now that I, d I did give myself that caveat uh, at GetUp. Let's try and have one more little look. And if it's still not playing ball, then I'll move on to the second part of my demo. Oh, just as I started terminating the pod, it decided to, to kick into gear. Let's try it one more time. So. Once we, let's just get rid of this pod, and we'll try it again. We've got a little bit of time. So it's just pulling my image down. Interestingly enough, this cluster is in my shed in South London. It's, uh, I'm using Tailscale, and it's gone through there, and so that's kind of why I have a little bit of latency on here. However, I thought it was cheaper than having to host it uh, on a cloud provider. So that's something for me to learn in the future, that the Wi-Fi isn't necessarily the best. So whilst that's running in the background, we're going to switch to the other part of the demo. I mentioned Watchman, this controller manager. This is a pretty simple example of an admission controller. Quite simply put, if I go to cloud oh, code Watchman, 
And I go to control, create, apply, config, samples, pod, right? I think it's a simple Nginx pod, something like that. I don't, I don't know what it does. Let's have a look. You can see it's starting up. You can also see I've probably got some network latency because my pod images aren't being pulled very quickly. Yeah, there we go. Let's, let's kill that. That's a standalone static pod, so no harm done there. What I want to show you is how quickly this updates with flag D underneath open feature. So this has a very simple set of feature flags, an on-off variant. That's all that's happening here. So I'm going to change the default variant to on. There we go. I'm then going to go down to here. And what you can see, yes, a demo that works, finally. You can see that flag is set to blocking admission, right? So imagine you're working at a bank and you've got a cluster that is mission critical. You know that you've either had um, you know, a bad actor to join that cluster, or you've got a developer who's inadvertently creating resources that's destroying something or mutating something critical. By simply flipping that feature flag, you've blocked access for everyone in the cluster, which puts it in a safe space because you can you treat it like a box, you can forensically go through it. So this example of Watchman is designed to show you how you can do that with flagging. And just to show that it's not smoke and mirrors, we can just go and fix that. So we go to K9s, and we'll turn it back on momentarily. And we'll see if the other thing's finished pulling. No, this is, this is in for the long haul. It is a Node.js image, so it's probably about 15 gigs. Okay. All right, and we'll turn the Watchman system back on, and I'm silently relieved that I chose to do two demos rather than one. So that turns the variant back off. I'm not sure if I print anything in the log. Maybe I do. Yeah, I think I do. Yeah, so you can see here, what actually happens is I check in the log. I'm going to do a bonus round here, since we didn't get to see the other bit of the demo, and just show you very quickly actually what the code looks like from an implementer's point of view. So I hope you can see this. I have a webhook here. In my webhook, I have a, a component here, so it says get flag D value, right? That flag D value calls the SDK. So that calls the open feature client SDK. There's no connection string, as mentioned. You, you can set uh, the type of connection, so I think I do that in the main.go here, you see? Um, I tell a lie, I did put a connection string, but, that's, but it defaults to localhost anyway. And so I set the provider, I set gRPC, because gRPC is cool, um, and as you can see, it's gone through, it's checked to see, does this exist? This is just in a timeout loop, and it's then gone and done what I needed it to do. So we go back here, we can then create our pod once more. And I promise that that will be the end of my messing around with this. All right, so turn that to off, great. Let's create our Nginx pod again. Uh, apply. And there we go, pod created, exciting. Cool. So let's go and just summarize that. We didn't get to do the playground application. However, you can do that yourself on your own hardware that pulls stuff down properly and play around with it. It's generally available. The QR codes I had previously should give you some context as to where to get that from. It's on our GitHub under open feature. And the second demo we did was hitting the brakes if you need to stop a, a creation of a pod in a cluster. And of course, that is just the, the tip of the iceberg, right? Just doing something like the emission control is super simple. We can take it a lot further. We can put it inside a, a module for an ingress. We can put it inside some other piece of microservice behavior that needs to switch from services inside the cluster that perhaps potentially needs to mutate something else. So there's a lot of applications with that. And of course, that made me think, what's next, right? We're able to now mutate and uh, modify the incoming pod spec and put flag D inside of it. That's really great. We're able to enable users. But what about non-user-facing workloads? What about system workloads? And so I started another project because I get quite bored easily. And I thought I'd try another one. So this now, it's not quite ready for prime time. This is the API server in Kubernetes being rebuilt with flag D inside of it. So you can turn parts of the API server on and off dynamically. So feature gates, you can start to flick on. Now, if you've been a Kubernetes admin before, you'll know that you have to restart the kubelet and pass new parameters in to enable certain capabilities. It's not actually a code limitation. It's a decision to do that. And what I've started to go down the route of is building a project that will allow you to do that in the API server. And I think that's exciting because we can start to do upgrades. We can start to play around with capabilities. We can start to give developers access to features without fully committing. 
We can also go another direction as well. I've mentioned workloads from a persona of the management of the cluster. I've mentioned it from the application workload. But there's also another dimension, and that's actually taking it further down the tree, down the stack, into the infrastructure layer, top of rack switches, DPUs, smart NICs, starting to look at what needs network acceleration. Let's say I have something going on in the data path. I can analyze that and decide whether or not to put it through a network accelerated node. So putting flag D inside a scheduler could be something that could be quite interesting. And the evaluation system, which I didn't cover in a great detail, is getting fairly robust now. It also overlaps my previous talk about day two operations. With this sort of stuff, you can start to build um, declarative configuration for um, different types of failure mode, right? So effectively, when a, when a type of request comes in, you can build failure modes with the configuration flags. And I don't think that this was ever really something that anybody anticipated with feature flagging. One final thought just on this is flag D also has the capability to contact the remote API of a provider. So if you have a feature flag provider in the cloud, flag D can connect through its HTTPS service and talk to their API. Hands in the air, we haven't matured this very much. We haven't specifically done a vendor API, but it's there, all the code's there. So what you could then do is you could turn a feature flag on and off in the browser and it restarts your load balancer or it mo modifies something in your cluster. And I think that's a very interesting prospect for democratizing who and what gets run experimentally on your cluster. In terms of our roadmap, we're here, right? October, November soon, Christmas. By next March, going on April, we're going to be looking at maturing the project even further. Our roadmap is going to be shortly released. One of the things I didn't mention is I've just joined as a fairly neutral party on our governing board to try and help lay out this roadmap because we want people to have the confidence that they can start building production grade infrastructure against this. I want to finally share some links here for those of you who are interested in getting involved. The website, openfeature.dev, the repositories, the community, please do get involved. It's only made as good as the number of contributors and people that want to help us. We've had a really great start. We've already got one production use case coming in fairly soon, and we've got a lot of other folks who are looking at bringing it into their organizations. I thought I had a last slide. However, that is me, and I'd like to thank you for your attention. Cheers. <laughs>
you know, I think responsibility. We looked to, to open telemetry as well. We have to be very careful about making iterations on the schema once we've had people start to build towards it with SDKs and providers. But yes, again, it's under the schema's repository. Um, we have issues. <laughs> we all have issues, but we have issues if you want to, <laughs> if you want to participate. Also, if you're interested just in the architecture, we have um, OFEPs. OFEPs are open feature enhancement proposals. So if you want to get involved in the project, you think, you know what, I think you folks are doing a great job, but I think we should go in this direction, get involved. It's, it's a great way to keep things going. Um, I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Any more? Okay, well, thank you again for your participation. Any, everyone that's flying out tonight and tomorrow, safe flights, and thank you so much.